Efendim şimdi de sözü moderatörümüz İrem Dicil'e artıkça bırakıyorum. Buyurun hocam. Sonic Revenant. 
or in Spivak's term, can himself alter in his speed. Hearing her words left untranslated, mysterious, and unknown, we could only guess that they are possibly parts of the sentences already repeated by the two characters who are still alive, the father and the son. The same words are uh, translated later when she repeats them in the same flashback. And yet, even then, we do not have a typical flashback to the past images and sounds in synchronization. To this first time, these uh, sentences were uttered by the mother. This is a montage sequence made up of shots of their village, uh, of when their village was destroyed uh, by the soldiers, and before and after the destruction. In its anasonic gestures, next slide, this one, yes, thank you. In its anasonic gestures, the unique mismatch between the sounds and the images offered as an echoing sonic flashback disrupts the linear time understanding, suspends the temporal matching of events shown and heard, and doubles the chaos of the content in formal terms through the aesthetics of non-chronological temporality. Echoing the title and the topical interest of the film, flashbacks like this specific one operate ontologically in the film, shuffling the present, the past, and the future, mostly through sound. While the images are more or less distinguishable in their relationships to the order in which events happen. So, what do I mean by anisonicity? Uh, as you can read at the uh, first note here, um, the, the term that I'm pointing, the title of my part of the title of my dissertation um, that I wrote four years ago that I'm trying to return to. Um, so anasonicity is oral, can be defined as oral or sonic in nature, but at times inaudible or unsinkably or barely audible. It's an impossible orality that is modeled on Aikira Mizutonipi's theorization of avisuality. It's a new methodology to think about sound in cinema and to address new image and sound relations in contemporary global films like The Revenant here. Um, and on Lipid's Avisuality, we can say it is defined as visual in nature but invisible. Uh, another definition he provides by quoting Trinidad Ha uh, is the invisibility of the invisible within the visible. I know it's very confusing. Uh, it, takes, uh, it takes some time to understand what he's trying to say. But basically, he goes back to the uh, emergence of cinema. Um, when cinema was invented, he says, um, in 1895, it also marks the birth of what's like a psychoanalysis and the X-ray. And he calls these three phenomenologies or technologies as technologies of a visuality. Uh, what he means by that is basically um, what is invisible is now rendered, rendered visible and visual by, by these uh, certain technologies. Right? These technologies, uh, like the cinema, for example, shows us something uh, on the two-dimensional two screen, which looks like a three-dimensional image, right? Or the X-ray that shows the inside of the body. It, in a way, uh, turns the body inside out, right? And inscribes it on a surface. Uh, psychoanalysis is the same thing, it's your dreams that you talk to the psychoanalyst in a lab uh, sitting on that chair, right? And it, it, it becomes this uh, image that's visual that can be rendered and drawn onto a piece of paper, right? So all these three technologies here, they're birth here, and um, certain qualities of the visual as uh, it describes. The second voice we hear in this flashback sequence belongs to Glass. It is from the time of the attack on their village. The father is attending to his wounded son in their current roles reversed. First we see a child hawk stumbling with his shirt on fire and next is a shot of his burnt face attended to by Glass. 
In the sequence sonic flashback technique, the voices and sounds are echoed by the images to which the subtitle translations accompany. I will be right here in Pony if the first sentence uttered by Glass while he's not yet in the frame, and neither is the person he is addressing. Following Glass's words uttered in Pony and translated to English in the subtitles, we see Glass talking to the son who is lying on the ground with his burnt face and body. The father attending to his son after the attack on their village says, I will be right here. Reversing their roles one more time, we cut to the present. In other words, the wounded Glass lying on the ground attended by the son who is there for him uttering the same words, I am right here. The two voices, the father's in the flashback and the son's in the present, are united and cross-synchronized with the images, uh, with their images of attending to each other. Can we move on to the next slide? As long as you can grab uh, a breath you find, is this survival motto uttered by the two in their uh, voices united, right? This is, it is the uh, next sentence heard initially through the voice of one character. The sentence continues in the voice of one, in the voice of another, and finally completed by the two voices together. The sentence is echoed by the father and by the son, who, in a vertiginous spiral, echo each other, repeating after the mother, whose voice is later added to the echoing utterances of her sentences. The words uttered by the father to console his son in the flashback were actually a repetition, an echo of the mother's words uttered long time ago. And yet the film doesn't provide a clear temporal origin to when the mother utters these words. The consoling words uttered by the son, attending to the father in the present, then, are an echo of the past. In other words, the father attending to his son, to his son shown earlier at the beginning of the film, and we also saw it in this flashback. And yet, the repetition of the father's words in this flashback becomes an echo of the son's voice in the present. With their roles reversed, both repeating the words of the mother, the father and the son echo her voice like ghosts, suspended in between life and death. Turning to Derrida, we can offer the life after the attack on their village is about survival, a living on after death. As long as you can still grab a breath, you serve, you find. Is the survival motto transmitted from the mother to the father at an unidentifiable point in the past, which is later transmitted from the father to the son after the attack on their village, and now again from the son back to the father following the bear attack? Life becomes half-life in these characters' awareness of their potential deaths, in their life-affirming efforts of survival, that are only strengthened by their ordinary mornings, mourning their own lives, not waiting for their actual deaths. Such a temporal complication of the sound mix gets complicated further when we listen to Glass repeat his sentence, I will be here, which is mixed with the cries of a man and some wheezing and deep breathing. Perhaps all the three voices belong to Glass. The Glass crying after losing his wife, and the Glass seeing to his son's wounds and consoling him, saying, I will be here, and the heavy breathing Glass who cannot talk as a result of the damage to his neck, neck and the larynx done by the mother bear. This sound mix which sonically mashes the sounds of the past of a cry of a man, possibly Glass having lost his wife, and the voice of Glass consoling his son in the flashback, and the wounded father glass lying on the ground in the present, wheezing after the bear attack and consoled by his son, is anasonic, left atemporal, like an echo, which simultaneously belongs to the past, the present, and the future, rippling in time. The sound design also makes such a rippling audible in its crescendos and decrescendos, as you heard in the uh, clip we played. The next shot is of Glass standing and staring at a large tree at sunset. We hear three voices blending and repeating and echoing each other impossibly. The subtitle reads, you breathe, keep breathing. The family is truly one in the echoes of their voices, united in their voices that ascribe the boundaries of their bodies in an indiscernibility of the outside and inside and outside, dead and living, present and past. The film philosophizes through sound, 
breathing life into the characters' survival efforts, heard in their voices, echoing their ordinary warnings, to rule and sonicity, in other words, impossible synchronizations beyond life and death. death. Can I finish another page? No. Um, okay. So, since this was this clip that we played from the middle of the film was a reference to the opening scene, I would like to add something about the opening scene and finish. The opening scene, uh, or what we reflexively believe to be the present, due to the primacy effect of the filmic exposition, is rather passed by the future. The future coming in the form of the present rewrites or excribes and describes the presence of the opening. Is it possible to mark certain moment, moments as belonging to the past or the present or the future in this temporal labyrinth of the remnants? More specifically about the opening scene that troubles our understanding of presence and chronological time, we can ask how does sound mark the sequence as a trace, allowing an intemporality? Is it in the form of deferral, asynchronization, or repetition? Not having time to answer these questions, I would like to end by stating the revenant howls through sound and leaves us suspended, like the ghost of his story, between life and death, materiality and immateriality, past and future, through an honesty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful contribution that was. And now we will listen to Tasty Higgy uh, from Austin to Derrida and back, locating, locating the act of thinking in Soviet poetic documentaries. Uh, yes. countries, uh, the Baltic, Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they were under the Soviet rule, so this is in general, it can be applicable to uh, other countries as well. So um, uh, in the 1960s uh, there was this general wave of uh, freedom in the Soviet Union and that's why the poetic documentary emerged, because um, I don't know if you're acquainted with documentary film theory, uh, because one of the most uh, known uh, theorists is Bill Nichols, and he has created this classification of uh, different modes, like poetic, expository, observational, participatory, reflexive, performative, interactive. And there has been a very important suggestion added to it, which is the dogmatic documentary, which I find very interesting because uh, uh, when looking into the uh, Soviet film uh, documentaries, it's sometimes really hard to actually categorize under Bill Nichols' uh, modes. So the dogmatic documentary is uh, characteristic to the uh, Soviet rule. It was uh, suggested by Jin Shi Chu. Um, so I'm going to uh, concentrate on the more uh, liberal documentary period of the 1960s, um, where this more dogmatic style was. Uh, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, these are some images from the uh, this called the Baltic New Wave documentary. The more dogmatic style was at the beginning of 1960s being replaced by uh, more poetic and lyrical approaches. You can actually go back. You can still keep it. I don't have a lot of slides. Uh, in Soviet Union, the film documentary films usually had to be verbalized. They had to be. Uh, you had to speak what you mean. You couldn't just use the visuals. And this is why these films are very interesting because they are using the visual language to actually think say and act and um, 
Yeah, so uh, why people turned to documentary film in the Soviet Union was because it was a short form, uh, it was cheaper, it was easier to, uh, to do those films, and the feature films had to go through more uh, processes of uh, this censoring. So uh, documentary uh, genre was more free to say what you actually wanted to say. And now the question, uh, why am I talking now uh, about the old films of the 1960s? So why is it important to look at it now? Uh, it's because uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there has been a considerable amount of attention being paid to uh, Eastern European films and filmmakers. Uh, but Baltic states, uh, particularly the poetic documentary works, they have remained foreign to, to Western cinema scholars. So this is one key aspect, key aspect why it's important. And another is uh, what also uh, the keynote speaker this morning uh, told that we have so many different uh, digital platforms right now emerging and the uh, cinema viewing is uh, making a turn. So um, in recent years a considerable amount of uh, effort has been invested in digitizing and promoting the... We can go to the next slide now promoting the audiovisual heritage from, uh, from the Baltic States. So there are different platforms where you can uh, see those old films now. And uh, the availability of these different narrative features, news reads, documentaries, uh, has brought those films back to researchers' focus. So in response to this trend, there is this increased need for fresh perspectives. And Prior to now, these films mainly have uh, been under the, uh, the well, at their time they were on the, behind the Iron Curtain, the political boundary that limited their wider distribution. Some of those films were shelved, they were never shown because uh, the censors didn't approve them. So increasing access to these films now uh, has led to a growing interest in them, so inviting researchers and historians to offer new perspectives. Them. And this is the introduction to those films and uh, the, the turn to the poetic portrayal, uh, it also started to bring larger philosophical themes into those films, uh, more eternal themes, questions about time, existential, existential philosophy. And there are lots of different and difficult layers to explore because these films are mainly used visuals, they didn't rely on the narrators, on the spoken part. But what I'm more interested in is not those uh, philosophical themes, but is how these existential themes actually manage to emerge in these films. What is the thinking process of the film behind it? So, where is, where is it located? And in order to start thinking about it, I turn to, I guess you can just change the slide, I'm not a very good uh, slide follower, so let this be in front of us. I turn to Austin's language philosophy, um, if you know something about it then he distinguished between two types of statements, constatives and performatives. So constatives are utterances that describe and express information, they are factual, they have true value. You could say that they are either true or false. Um, performatives, on the other hand, are not meant to give information. They are statements that incite action. So they do the thing they utter. So one of the most important um, famous examples is, uh, is a statement said at a wedding ceremonial, I now pronounce you husband and wife, in which the uttering does not just describe the event, but it is actually the event. So by saying it, you are actually doing the deed. And this kind of uh, separation and seeing performative utterances as acts indicates that language is not just descriptive, straightforward uh, representation of reality, but it also embodies this contextual, fluid and self-assertive creative force. And although Austin's work is strongly grounded in philosophy of language and was not meant for discourses dealing with fictionality like film, which we are talking about. His theories have a certain universality that transcend the boundaries of this original medium. And um, there have been a lot of uh, 
advancements of this theory. So I'm not going into them because I don't have time, but these are the names. And the most interesting of them I find is Derrida, uh, who in his essay, uh, Signature Event Context, uh, you can also change the slide, um, brought out some criticism towards Austin's ideas. Uh, Austin says, for instance, that uh, when poets write something or quotes, it's in her poem, it becomes hollow. So the same is with a play on the stage. So Austin didn't think that performatives fit to fictional discourses. Uh, the actor quotes everyday speech, and this for Austin is artificial, parasitic, and doesn't work as a true performative. Uh, but Derrida, in contrary, says that uh, the utterance itself is a citation. For instance, the I do in a marriage context. The I do needs to be uh, citatable, iterable, <laughs> it's a type of citation. So I have a quote here from Derrida. Uh, the conventionality of speech act implies that it must be formulated according to a recognized coded or iterable model. That is, it must function as a citation that is repeatable in an endless number of contexts. So, Derrida means that the performative force of language lies in the fact that it is separate from the intentions of the author. Now, where I see that this could work is when thinking about the poetic documentaries through the lens of here and now, because Derrida says that the, uh, with performatives there's no intention or, uh, yeah, no, the, there's this absence of the addressee. Um, there's an anthropologist, Alexei Yurchak, whose quote I also have here, who says that the conventionality of the speech act implies that it must be formulated according to a recognized coded or iterable model. That is, it must function as a citation that is repeatable in an endless number of contexts. So, he proposes an understanding of the period of late socialism in the Soviet Union, uh, identifying a shift in the public language use and uh, he sort of uh, relies on both the Derrida and Austin. Uh, he says that the authoritative form, or the public speeches, rituals, texts, they became a place for performative repetitions, so which ultimately hollowed it and made it empty, so that you could fill it with uh, performative meaning. And this goes together with Derrida, who, who says that this uh, citating this makes this performative a uh, performative. Um, so Yurcha conceptualizes this phenomenon as a performative shift. It means that uh, the ideological discourse, uh, the surface of the um, Soviet Union's discourse, uh, lost its constitutive descriptive value and was instead uh, filled with performative meanings. And this was because they were iterable, citable repetitions that became performative through constant citing. So my aim, however, is to try and locate the thinking process in a more close and precise way. So this Derrida-inspired approach, it shows how the iterability renders the constative into a performative. The surface narrative, making that performative by repeating. But um, here I feel that the Austinian framework works better in locating the exact point how the dominating narrative was subverted by the visual poetic narrative. So I'm trying to see in those films a certain poetic elements that uh, act as small utterances which are independent of reality with this uh, inherent agency to think, create and question the same way as Austin's performative work in language. So, um, we can go forward with the, with the slides, yeah. Uh, I have an example here. Uh, it's not the most characteristic one, but I hope it gives an idea of how uh, the performatives might work. So this is a film by Lithuanian director, Roberta Sverba, called The Old Man and the Land. Uh, a lot of these poetic works, they use this archaic imagery, villages, old people, to form a connection to the pre-Soviet times where people were free. So this was one of them and uh, the beginning of the 
film. Okay, I'm not actually going, but yeah, you can go back. Still, yeah, this one. Okay, so I will just skip some of it. Yeah, this is a film about this old man whose wife dies, and the old man has uh, five sons, and all of them are very educated school teachers. So this film has this surface uh, dogmatic narrative uh, where you have the heroes who work hard and help in modernizing the Soviet uh, life. And underneath that narrative there are performatives, uh, small utterances which start to uh, work against this dominating narrative. So there's a scene in the film where in a corner of the classroom there's a little boy who uh, is walking towards the camera and drops a globe that he is holding. He's startled and confused and after a short hesitation he starts to cry. However, there's a dissonance between the boy's crying and the image. The sound is not synchronous with the image and turns out to be non-diegetic, intensified and distant. So, this is a performative act that enables the reality to become stretched. Uh, the loose, almost untied sound of a child's cry makes the shot uh, oscillate between the constative and performative, maintaining a connection with the image. But at the same time, it dislocates it by creating feelings of discomfort and confusion. So the confusion of this seemingly at first descriptive image, uh, it can be read as the act of a performative. Uh, this shot is now not describing reality, but is actively creating it. It affects a meaning that also reaches into the next scene, filling it instantly with notions of disruption, loss, and desolation. So the next scene, which is uh, the man sitting there, uh, it further establishes the sense of unease, showing the old man sitting on a cemetery bench, with the camera zooming in on the back of his head. So with this act, the camera breaks the connection that the shot has with conventional documentary representation, and the constitutive image is immediately disrupted. The old man becomes removed from the surrounding environment. His thoughts appear isolated and his loneliness is amplified. So this is not to inform the viewer that uh, the old man's wife has just died. It's not describing it. It is... Um, acting on it. It is using these performative elements in order to shift from the informational descriptive depiction to a more internal perspective, uh, affecting with it awareness of time and temporality. So the performative utterances can be identified in exactly these kinds of uh, minor instances, in moments where small deviations from realist depiction bring about qualities that this uh, direct referential relationship lacks. So in these poetic films, the Soviet documentary poetic films, um, performatives are short on beings that run parallel to the surface narratives. They are not noticed by the dominating narrative, so they start to exist outside of the present moment, connecting these films with the somewhat nostalgic pre-Soviet times. This film and the other Baltic uh, New Wave documentary films, you can switch the slides, just some images here, they used performatives to create a semantic shift away from this socialist surface structure towards a more traditional, meaningful sensibility. So the Austinian division between the constitutive and the performative, yeah, I think it helps to articulate how meaning in these specific documentaries was affected. And it does it in a more precise level than the Derrida, Derrida's idea of performative as a citation would do. And Austin's ideas, I think they help to explain how the works of the Baltic New Way, how they managed to establish by reordering the locus of the meaning, this continuity between the present and the pre-Soviet times. So, in this regard, the performative instances or the elements of this film's style, they work as catalysts
to generate a more subjective and personal truth of everyday reality. So by conceptualizing certain poetic elements as performative utterances, this challenges the belief that the essence of meaning lies primarily in representation, which is something that is very important in documentary film. Thus, the truth in these Soviet last sentences. <laughs> the truth in these Soviet sentences, not sentences. Uh, the truth in these Soviet poetic documentaries. The truth that reveals reveals itself uh, not through this direct description of reality, but it's instead brought into being through the aspects of reality that are shaped by these small aesthetic elements of this film. These little elements, uh, poetic insertions into the more dogmatic narrative, they catalyze the juxtapositioning of different realms, the poetic, nostalgic past and the Soviet present. I will finish here. Thank you.